Good, af good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the European leg of this global digital services client event, Digital Horizons. And this European event, we're going to explore on how to, um, how to make our cities more resilient using digital solutions. And especially for you, we uh, are doing this from the Amsterdam office, uh, on which we have um, a couple of very exciting clients. I'm very happy uh, to invite them here in our office. Uh, first of all, we're going to have uh, Carol Masterson. He's the commercial director of uh, Transport Infrastructure Ireland, and he's going to uh, talk about his perception on, on digital services in, in his uh, area. Then also we got Sasha Stolp, the director of innovation in Amsterdam. She's going to give us a perspective. Then um, Wouter Lomans, he's a senior project development uh, project developer. And, uh, and he's going to give his perspective and how he's using a, a digital innovation on, his, on, a, on a project of his. And then last but not least, there's Michaela Turin, associate professor at the TU Delft. <coughs> and um, she's going to give another perspective. And finally, we're going to then have a panel discussion uh, with each other, exploring this team a bit further. So now, without any further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to Will uh, Cavendish, who's going to uh, give an introduction into this afternoon. Thank you very much. Welcome from me to Digital Horizons, a whole day showcasing the opportunities, challenges and debates about the role of digital in our world. I'm delighted to be able to kick things off with a short presentation about what we in Arab have learnt and think about some of these issues. First, we know the built environment challenge is growing and profound. Over the next couple of decades, the world's population will rise to 10 billion and we need to meet their needs in an equitable fashion. Their needs for habitation, their needs for energy, for water, for transportation. Within that, two and a half billion more people will be living in cities, cities that we need to plan, design and build. In other parts of the world, most of the buildings that we need have already been built. Another challenge for us to face. And of course, we need to do all of this while we're living within planetary boundaries, particularly the planetary boundaries of carbon and nature plus. So we're going to need to meet the needs of more people in more equitable ways, while at the same time making sure we preserve our planet. Now, the good news is that there are some great new and existing digital technologies that can help us with this task. And in Arab, we think there are six really significant ones that are going to be useful for us. The power of artificial intelligence and machine learning, allowing us to explore big data in new ways and provide new insights about the challenges we face. The proliferation of data that's coming from sensors, drones and satellite technology, offering new opportunities and new frontiers for our understanding. The ability to develop and deploy digital twins for both simulation and optimization of operations and asset management. The power of the Internet of Things, 5G networks and cloud computing in providing a modern, scalable technology infrastructure to the built environment. The ability of generative design to, to use algorithms to design things in different ways and better ways than we've been able to do before and the on onset of robotics and automation as new tools, new solutions, new opportunities for us. These six technologies, we believe, are very powerful and offer us great opportunities in our work going forward. And on the back of those, we already know that digital can critically enable the pathway to net zero, to climate resilience and to nature. For example, the ability to use generative algorithms to design buildings in different ways than we've been able to previously and optimise a whole range of complex factors to improve outcomes. In some cases, reducing embodied carbon by up to 50% over a more traditional design. Or indeed, using the power of data and analytics and structural modelling to improve significantly the climate resilience of buildings portfolios with an opportunity cost of perhaps $3 trillion of savings and improvement across our building stock around the world. Or the ability to use Earth observation data to both map and improve biodiversity net gain. So contributing 
significantly to Nature Plus. So digital enabling net zero, climate resilience and Nature Plus, but also digital enhancing our ability to meet human needs. Our ability again to use satellite data to map cities and districts at a level we've never been able to do previously to design nature-based solutions that bring the power of green, blue and grey infrastructure to improve the functioning, livability and biodiversity of our cities. Things like smart buildings platforms that allow us to take the enormous power of data in, inside our buildings to improve human well-being, improve occupancy and also reduce significantly energy, perhaps by up to 30% of traditional buildings and the ability to use digital twins to map, analyze, understand and take, the, through, take us through the pathway of shifting towards a more decentralized, more resilient, more renewable energy system, absolutely vital to the future of our energy and absolutely vital to the future of the pathway to net zero. So digital tools, techniques, capabilities also enhancing our ability to meet human needs. However, there's always a but. Firstly, when we step back and look at the pace of digitisation in the built environment, the truth is it's only just started. Compared to other sectors that are much more advanced, digitisation is at its early stages, for example, in something like construction. Now, the corollary of that is that we're going to need all to put in a huge effort and huge investment to create the kinds of technology, data and digital infrastructures that are going to be needed and on which many of our digital solutions are going to need to sit. And that's going to be costly over the next 10 to 20 years. Very hard to estimate how much, but tens if not hundreds if not more billions of dollars are going to be required to be invested in the sector in order to create the fundamental platform of digitization that we need. Secondly, unlike other well-known technology sectors, particularly consumer technology sectors, where whole new companies or whole new technologies seem to come out, of the, the, you know, come, out of, come out of the blue and get implemented very quickly. Think of the current debate around something like ChatGPT. In our world, it's different. We live in a world of deep tech, where our solutions need to be rooted in engineering and science, where research takes time, where it takes time to develop the solutions, scale them, prove them, and make them available and usable in the world of buildings, construction, and infrastructure. And not only does it take more time, but it also means that the whole sector needs to work much more closely in partnership. Incumbent firms, startups, governments, regulators, financiers, venture capitalists, and of course consumers and clients, all are going to need to work together to pull through the deep tech solutions that our sector needs. And that's going to take longer, so there's no time to lose. We need to get cracking now. Third, our sector is really rather used to building new things rather than reusing what we've already got. But particularly with the rise of embodied carbon, we're going to need to treasure and preserve and reuse and refurbish what we already have compared to just thinking about greenfield and new build. Again, digital technologies have a great opportunity here. So, for example, in refurbishing and reusing existing buildings, a critical task is to understand their structural state. What's their state of repair? How have they deteriorated or otherwise over the 40 or 50 or 60 years of their design life? Digital tools, structural modelling, new forms of data, new forms of machine learning allow us to understand that in a way we weren't able to do previously. And that allows us to keep and reuse structures and buildings that otherwise we might have just written off. Likewise, when looking at the lifespan of a complex asset like a, a long span bridge, we can again use the combination of structural engineering, data insights and advanced simulations to properly understand how that infrastructure is performing and how it can be repaired and improved to last another 20 and 30 years. And that's an, an example that we Arup have done on a, on a bridge, for example, in the Netherlands. And even for more recent assets like offshore wind, the same issues. How can we extend the life of what's already there? How can we optimise the maintenance of that asset and the operation of that asset? We can use machine learning, data and digital and insights to provide fresh understanding about how that can be done and how we can prolong the economic life of existing assets. Finally, though, so much change in our world is now being driven by public policy, by commitments that are being made internationally, regionally and nationally towards climate change, towards climate resilience, 
towards nature plus and other areas as well, these are the things that are driving change in our sector, whether it's the EU Green Deal or the American Inflation Reduction Act or the Chinese commitment to peak emissions in 2030 and reduce or India's commitment to be net zero over the next decades. These are the commitments, the policies that are shaping our sector and providing the dynamic for change in our sector. But that means we're going to need to get better at working with governments, understanding governments, collaborating with public agencies and public policy to achieve the kind of changes we want to see. So the good news is that we have some fantastic digital technologies that we can use and deploy in our sector. The good news is that we know already they're helping us head towards net zero, improve climate resilience, get to nature plus, and provide services at scale for the population in the way we need. But there are challenges. We've barely started. We need to take time to develop the kinds of deep tech solutions that are, that are needed. We're going to need to increasingly focus on what we've already got rather than what we need to build. And we as a sector are going to need to get ever better and, more, and work ever more closely with decision makers and public policy agencies. But if we do all of that, the opportunity is very significant. And whether it's harnessing data in the built environment, whether accelerating urban innovation, whether it's promoting climate resilience, whether it's moving towards net zero and a nature positive future, or whether it's designing and delivering the future transportation, all the topics for our sessions today, there is an enormous opportunity to harness digital to tackle the world's needs. Thank you, and I hope the day is a wonderful one. So thank you, Will, for setting the scene so very clearly. And um, let's move on to the next uh, speaker, which is Kachal Masterson. And he's going to uh, give his perspective on how uh, these digital services are changing the way um, he's um, he uh, operates in the infrastructure space. After uh, Kachal's uh, uh, presentation, we've asked Lauren State, Director of Transport, in our Amsterdam office to ask uh, Kachal some questions. Thanks, Lawrence. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for uh, the invite for today's session. Um, you might show the first slide, if you can, please. So, yeah, so I have maybe three or four slides just to talk you through. So, I, I work for a transport infrastructure agency in Dublin, um, and we look after the road network, the national road network in Ireland, and also the light rail network in Dublin. We're also doing uh, more work on cycling infrastructure across uh, the country as well. And we're also looking to uh, tackle the rollout of uh, charging infrastructure for um, the fleet as that fleet transitions towards um, electric charging over the next number of years. So next slide, please. And I think the last speaker, Will, mentioned the public policy driving the agenda, and it's a very similar situation in Ireland. So the call to action for us is through uh, our own national climate action plans, um, which cover all the different sectors of the economy, including transport and infrastructure. Um, also, this, this drive and push to um, transform the transport sector from a, the current state into a, a truly sustainable uh, sector, and then also to look at transforming the energy consumption in transport uh, from almost heavily dependent on fossil fuels to electrification and possibly hydrogen for certain applications as well. So next slide, please. So one of the areas that we have been looking at and trying to tap into, I suppose, the digital potential of modeling is around the future of road pricing and road user charging across uh, our road network. And we're looking to transition from uh, quite a traditional um, tolling operation, which we have uh, across the motorway network, to a next generation um, distance-based user charging model, which would help us achieve some of the objectives we have around funding the asset management and, and operation of the network, but also in driving behaviors and changing behaviors to nudge the users of that network toward, towards more sustainable uh, patterns of transport. Um, and that might be in terms of 
assessing the time of day uh, when people use the network and asking the, asking them to make different choices in that. It may be incentivizing different types of vehicles. So the cleaner the vehicle, the lower the charge that they would pay on the network. And also ensuring that we connect the trips which are being made across the network with the urban areas uh, which the network uh, uh, connects and serves. Um, and trying to ensure that uh, when we um, say consider the functionality of the road network that we are not simply pushing traffic into urban areas and urban environments which uh, uh, you know which can't handle that so part of the, the modeling that we've been doing with the Arab team is to look at this this concept of agent based modeling and that is a different type of modeling from the tra traditional transport modeling um, and we've spent two or three years collectively looking at that and trying to firstly convince ourselves as to the value of it and some of our stakeholders who have been a little bit resistant to changing how we model. Uh, so one of the, the solutions to that is we say, look, we're going to use the traditional models as well as the agent-based model um, to assess the individuals using uh, the transport system and the interaction that those individuals have and the choices that they make. And that allows us then to build up a synthetic population across the country and then test various um, types of, of, of uh, models for user charging from the very traditional model to much more sophisticated uh, satellite tolling models and that. And that's proved to be very beneficial um, as we all hopefully will understand that no mode in transport exists in isolation. And the power of the agent-based model allows us to connect users' behaviours and users' patterns across the different modes that they may choose to use over any particular day uh, or any particular week. Um, so just move to the next slide as well, please. And once we had built the agent-based model for the, the national road network and incorporated the different modes within that, uh, it allowed us then to move on to our uh, more recent challenge, which we started to look at, and that's how to equip the national uh, network with EV, electric vehicle charging infrastructure and charge points across that network and try to understand you know, the level of infrastructure which we will require, where that should be, um, what type of volumes will we be uh, seeking to service, uh, you know, and right down to the various times of day, times of week, and the types of um, seasonality that we might see in Ireland in the difference between charging, say, for summertime at, the, at different locations and wintertime at different locations. So the, the agent-based modeling, again, brings us back to this idea that we're not just looking at average usage across the network and um, AADT, this annual average daily traffic. What we're doing is trying to assess different user behaviors and try to understand how best we can serve them and also how we can and nudge them to make better choices and more informed choices. So my last slide then is really just to summarize a couple of things here, I guess, for, for, the, for today. Firstly, is that the modeling itself, I think, assists us in asking different questions to the traditional modeling. It also helps us challenge the biases which we have, and we will all have them, and, and there's, there's lots of research um, on the various biases which are at play. Um, in the transport sector, um, and it also helps us really imagine the, the the scenarios for a future, and in particular for a better future, and to be able to then design and implement schemes and projects around that. So we believe that this whole move to sustainable development needs to understand human behaviours and the choices that they make and design interventions around that. We know equity is a huge issue in transport today. It's it's there's a lot now being written about that, and uh, you, you know the, the I suppose the summary of of the issue with equity equity as I see it is that it a lack of equity in the system will limit um, mobility choices that people have, and that will deny certain uh, cohorts of our society access to opportunities, and that in turn creates issues for for society and creates problems for a country at all sorts of levels. Um, so, so understanding the choices that people make um, um, are very important and understanding that people aren't really average um, um, in how they, they go about making those choices. The only thing that average helps us with is perhaps um, dealing with uh, the structural integrity, if you like, of the asset base, designing our, our station 
uh, capacities or our bridge capacities, but doesn't really help us design the services that use the network uh, very well because, as you say, nobody really acts in an average uh, uh, way, you know, most of the time. Um, so this this uh, push, I suppose, to use the digital modelling um, and represent the individual or the individual agent within that modelling really gives us much more uh, powerful tools uh, to be able to uh, to to you know assess those those uh, uh, different questions which we have and challenge the biases we have. And just in terms of conclusion. Um, the, the photograph on the slide is Mary Robinson, who was a f the first uh, female president in Ireland. Um, she then went on to be, become the UN Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, and she's now active, really a, a vocal, uh, a, a strong vocal voice in, in the challenge you know, to, to help in equity, justice, climate change. And Mary Robinson has proposed sort of three areas that we should collectively focus on in this challenge around uh, climate change. And the first is around, you know, making it personal, ensuring that we can do what we can do in our various personal lives and particularly in the jobs that we have. I think that's very important for us in the transport sector. Also to get, get angry and get disruptive and find other people who are also disruptive. And I think that really chimes well with me because we are seeking to talk to other agencies and other uh, um, across the transport sector, for example, to be able to start to build material together and solutions together and not be doing this in, a light, in, in an isolated fashion. But the third principle, I think, is the one that really sums up the reason why we are using agent-based modelling. And it's around imagining a better world. And it can be quite difficult in the transport space to do that without having the right tools. And agent-based modelling helps us with that. It really helps us test those scenarios and help us imagine uh, better futures and also to sell them when we're talking to other stakeholders. So that's everything I have for today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Cahill. Can you uh, can you hear me? Uh, it's Lawrence here. I'm uh, here in Amsterdam. Uh, I, I can hear you loud and clear, Lawrence. Super, super. Hi. Yeah, thanks. Um, th great. Thank you very much for that presentation and uh, an inspiring view on how you look at uh, the sector of transport and also uh, uh, a, ref you know, uh, a refreshing uh, approach to, to mobility and uh, Certainly in, in, in our interactions that we've had together in the last couple of years, certainly in, in London and in uh, Brussels last year, um, the really, I see a lot of parallels with what we're seeing in, 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 in other European nations. I'm calling, we're, we're speaking today from, from Amsterdam, uh, and certainly as you know, Amsterdam is facing similar, uh, the Netherlands is facing similar challenges in introducing schemes for pay for use uh, for mobility, uh, which we're, as you know, assisting uh, uh, the, the, the government with. Um, and what really inspires me from your uh, approach, and certainly um, the just transportation approach, if I, if I could uh, qualify it as that, is, is really the focus on, on the individual and, 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 and uh, uh, not looking at uh, averages. Um, and I'm really, uh, I've got two questions for you, really. Just one, thinking about reflecting on ABM and the approach for ABM and your, and your learnings from that approach. And the second, more looking forward to so your new uh, 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 visit of electrification and the role of, of this kind of thinking electrification. Um, on the first on ABM, really just um, uh, the different type of modeling and, and an understanding in infrastructure. How, how have you seen that um, uh, really come about in... Uh, examples in the conversations that you've had uh, with authorities introducing uh, 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 new forms of charging and how has it helped you bring forward some of those insights of uh, individual behaviors and and demo, you know demo demographic uh, uh, re reflections read some some ideas and, and some some thoughts on that the second question about electrification maybe I'll just um, mm -hmm. uh, is really looking at um, the how you how you see uh, the opportunities for um, this form of approach to help enable uh, data sharing and interoperability across uh, a network of services offering electrification for vehicles? Just, just think, thinking about those uh, f from from your new your new role, uh, shall we say? So, a couple of questions. Yes. Okay, thanks, Lauren. So I'm, I might take the second question first, if I may, because it's for myself anyway. It's sort of slightly easier to answer, 
and that we've been working in the tolling sector and with um, other European uh, agencies on the kind of topic of uh, EATS and European interoperability for uh, tolling customers. Um, and I think that's a useful perspective because it sort of starts with the customer experience and then works back to see what level of um, infrastructure and digital infrastructure we require to support a, a seamless customer journey across the tolling sectors in Europe, particularly for the freight um, customers. And I think the, the model that we are using and some of the other um, um, member states are using is this kind of data sharing hub concept, interoperability hub concept, and it works very effectively in tolling. And we have been assessing that as a concept which we could bring into the electric vehicle charging space as well. Um, and that could allow us to do maybe two particular things. One is to understand that as we connect our EV charging infrastructure to the hub, we can test and understand the level of usage, um, the, the length of charging sessions, the number of unique sessions by unique users, um, the typical uh, charge of a vehicle from, let's say, 20% to 80% of battery charge or whatever the patterns are. And it allows us then to be much more efficient as we deploy even more EV charging over the next decade, 15 years or so, as our fleets transition from the fossil fuel to the, the electric vehicle. So it will provide us with, with excellent um, insight um, on that journey and allow us to be much more efficient. And uh, efficient is good in terms of the use of our materials, um, the, the amount of land that we're going to have to dedicate to EV charging. We want to minimize that as much as possible. So it'll be a critical uh, component of that. And the second part of it, it will also allow uh, the users to have a seamless service across the various charge point operators in our jurisdiction or when they move countries as well. So, as, you know, it's maybe not so prevalent in Ireland to uh, travel with our vehicles across Europe, but we do do it a little bit. I know it'll be much more prevalent if, if for the Netherlands or for some of your neighbours um, being able to charge as you go across uh, various member states. And the interoperability platforms can help connect that experience and ensure that, um, you know, the users don't require like five, six, ten accounts, which was the problem that we had in the tolling sector, which we're still trying to solve and is a problem today in the EV charging infrastructure. So I think interoperability and data sharing is a really important uh, aspect of that. And we need to continue collectively to push hard on that. Um, on, on your first question, that's a little bit trickier, I guess, because I did find culturally, as we started to use the agent-based modeling, we did we did get quite a bit of resistance to that from, I would say, more the capital program side of the house, not just in TII, but with other agencies. And if you think about it, the modeling done traditionally for um, big schemes, highway schemes, railway schemes, you know, like the, the, at that level, averages do work okay because you're starting to figure out you know, the scale, the scope, the strength of that infrastructure, which is going to be required. Um, but when you're trying to optimize your services, that's really where the agent-based model um, um, can come into play more. Or, which I know is the case we're all trying to do, trying to connect those services much, much more closely together and connect from road to rail, um, um, even into aviation and, and, and maritime to try and understand how an agent will move across those various transport modes um, particularly moving into then the space of, of bicycle, electrical or e-mobilities and um, the stuff that's kind of coming uh, to the fore now with mobility as a service. So having that understanding of how an agent could interact with all that complexity is, is going to be vital for us. Uh, and, and again, going back to that efficiency argument, it will prevent us from um, investing too much in any one mode. Those modes will really need to work together. It's, it's you know, from a customer perspective, transport is a system. They're not really thinking about mode. They're thinking about where they want to get to and why they want to get to where they're traveling. And we, we did some work with True Yourselves as well, Lawrence, you will know, with the, um, the New Zealand Ministry for Transport, who were on a similar journey to TII on the um, agent-based modeling side. And again, they found that they really had to convince people, and we're still trying to do that, as to why we should use a different form of modeling. Now, we're not fully there yet on that, but the more discussions we have, um, I think, on, on it as a topic, and we're not trying to get rid of the traditional modeling. We're not trying to put that in the dustbin. We want these two, two, two tools to work together in parallel. 
Thanks, uh, Kahol. Thanks for that answer. Yes, and uh, indeed, uh, similar discussions, similar uh, challenges uh, also here in the Netherlands. And I think uh, just reflecting on your uh, the interoperability question, Data Hub, we've also had some. Uh, there are also parallels for other uh, industries as well, and, and the interoperability and data sharing exercise can be useful for other asset uh, managers who have who want to give assets uh, or want to give an understanding of their assets to a customer base. So really, not forgetting that there are cost customers that we uh, represent, populations that we represent, individuals is uh, is really my my big uh, takeaway of that. I'm just looking at the organisers to see if we've got time for one more question. But I don't think so. Do we have another time for a question or? Um, just looking into the room, are there any more questions? Are there any more questions for Kachel? No more questions. Thank you. So, uh, really, on behalf of uh, Digital Horizons, uh, uh, really thanks, uh, Kachel, for your presentation. And um, I'll uh, yeah, wish you a good rest of your afternoon, and I'll hand over back to, uh, to Matthew. Thanks, uh, Kachel. Thanks. Thank thanks, you. Lawrence. <laughs> Applause well due. Thank you. Thanks, Lawrence, for uh, doing this uh, this uh, small introductory session. Okay, to the to the main event. I'm going to explore. Um, I'm going to explore. Uh, uh, yeah, digital innovations in cities. And for that, we have uh, three speakers back to back. Um, first of all, I want to welcome Shasha Stolp, director of innovation of the city of Amsterdam, and she's going to explain to us today why uh, a city is so important as a launching customer for digital innovation and climate change. I, I don't think I need to yeah, uh, yeah, I'm already backed up. Thank you very <laughs> much for the opportunity of being with you all. Well, my name is Sir Stop. I'm Director of Innovation for the Future Proof Asset Program. So I'm not so much aware in being only digital, but how do we transform, how do we meet the future in the projects that we're doing today, actually? How can we be launching customer on many ways to innovation? I don't know if my slides are on yet or... Oh, yes. That's over here. Here we go. That's better. Well, this was the start. How we have designed our cities, how we use them actually, yes, is on an individual base. But very funny enough, how we use our roads, but also sports pitches, our parks, it's quite similar actually. We use them in a similar way, even if we are in Istanbul, Tokyo, Dublin, Amsterdam, if the weather is nice and there's water, we take a walk around it. So the way we maintain our cities is not only an opportunity to keep a city as it is, but become part of this new movement of not only learning about new ideas, but only setting the stage for new innovation. And that's not really only a small investment, but it's also about how do we work together? Because we face and share the same future challenge. And I like this church very much. It is stretched over a period of 500,000 years. And what you see in the middle is the CO2 concentration worldwide averaged. And on the top, you see the global temperature. And down, you see the sea level. And what you actually, if you see it in a large period of time, you see that they are quite similar. But if you look to the uh, charge in the above, it is only a difference of six degrees. And down below, it is a hundred meter. When I'm a city in a region which is surrounded by three sides by water, which is shrinking and sea level is rising, well, you can calculate it for yourself, a hundred meter to six degrees. At 16 meters per degree sea level rise, which will approach that. And we are here right now. We've never been there yet in all the time of 500,000 years. So what you can say, we are facing a non-traditional safety issue, actually. And do we already face climate change? Yes, we do. This was in August 2020, when we only had dry feet thanks to almost all our emergency pumps available by the Dutch army. 
when we had a stormwater event in 2014, it was only stormwater for an hour. But it damaged 75, mi uh, 75 million euros. Then we have droughts. It was the previous summer again. We're facing problems with our drinking water, while we still depend on drinking water coming from the Rhine. And this is probably the biggest threat, heat stress. And it's about morbidity, it's about health issues, about the safety of our people. And then what can we do as our role of being a customer, a customer to you? And we are, as cities, large customers. While everybody is always focused on new builds and on um, uh, national entities, Public uh, investors in cities are for approximately 70% your customer. And while we are doing usually what we did, because we know the standards, we know what we ask, we have in Amsterdam a little bit a luxury position because we do have an own department of engineering. We have 1,300 engineers working to the city of Amsterdam. So we can work directly together as public engineers towards a public customer, our asset manager. And it helps because it are large customers. We spend over 250 to 300 million euros annually to just maintaining our city. And if we keep doing that the same way we do that, we will have no solutions facing climate change and we won't become a resilient city. And that's not only because we haven't done it, we are not part of the chain, but because our organization doesn't know how to act. It's also about how do we collaborate together as humans in this very urgent area. So we use 10% of our assignment to become a launch customer of innovation, to really become part of the change. And yes, we do take some risks. And we're not only doing that for infrastructure, but also for sports. Because in many cities, it's also a public entity and you're also a public launching customer. So for instance, the city of Amsterdam has 555 sports pitches, 49 sport parks. We have 27 indoor stadiums, and we also have sport facilities based on schools. But it's more interesting, all our sports public assets use for, uh, are the fourth user of energy in the whole of the city. Can you imagine how much we use? We spend average 40 million euros uh, annually to it. But actually, the question, how can we use this assignment to become part of the technology readiness level. So how can we invest, especially in TRL7, when you want to have pilots done in a really live case? So that's the moment when we step in. And it's not only stepping in, but it's also knowing exactly what was said previously. If you want to have new knowledge, you have to know each other's rhythm of acting. I can ask for a regular project and I can have it tomorrow. But if I want to have new knowledge, I have to take into account that it takes some time before this new knowledge is, is brought together and is done. So it's not about question today, but it's having this long-term approach. What do we have to reach and how can I act today? And in the next slide, I want to show you a little movie about what we did with turf sport pitches. And our assignment was get cool turf sport pitches because right now they are contributing to heat stress and not a little bit. Ja, we zoeken eigenlijk uh, steeds uh, vernieuwing in het product sport en met name de sportvelden. Voor ons is het TKI project uh, van groot belang omdat wij hier veel met sport bezig zijn, maar ook naar vernieuwingen zoeken. De gemeente Amsterdam die heeft meegedaan omdat wij eigenlijk zoeken naar oplossingen voor de stad. Wat wij veroorzaken in de kunstgasvelden is gewoon dat het te warm wordt. Dus we hebben echt gezocht naar opties en mogelijkheden om dat op te gaan lossen. Nou, 
Het mooie aan TKI project is, is dat je samenwerkt met productontwikkelaars, onderzoekers en eindgebruikers. Daardoor hebben we eigenlijk een hele mooie keten kunnen maken van laponderzoek, proefvelden op het marine terrein en uiteindelijk een bijna fullscale kunstgrasveld bij Laan van Spartaan. Toen het TKI project City Sports werd opgezet was het voor ons allereerst natuurlijk belangrijk om een koelend kunstgrasveld te creëren. Uh, en daarbij was het voor ons erg belangrijk om een kunstgrasveld te ontwikkelen wat ook daadwerkelijk voldoet aan alle normen van de sportbonden. Wij wilden een alternatief vinden die gezonder zou zijn voor de sporter en de stad. Het hele concept is dat we water wat dus opgeslagen is, dus regenwater wat in die bergingslaag is gevallen, dat dat door capillaire opstijging weer terugkomt uiteindelijk bij het oppervlak. Nou, daar zitten dus allerlei stapjes tussen en daar moet contact zijn. Die capillaire nalevering via de rug van de mat naar de invul van de mat, dat was eigenlijk een hele grote vraag van gaat dat wel goed? Op het marine terrein is uitvoerig getest op verdamping. Dat systeem is vervolgens in het laboratorium bij Kiwa Isa Sport uitvoerig getest op de sporttechnische eigenschappen. Je wil natuurlijk niet alleen maar een veld creëren dat koelt, maar het moet ook qua sporttechnische eigenschappen voldoen. En toen dat door de keuring kwam, is dat trainingsveld geïnstalleerd bij Laan van Spartaan in Amsterdam. We kwamen vanuit 70 graden warmte, stress. En dat bleek dat we nu eigenlijk terug waren gekomen tot een, het afkoelen van zo'n veld. Wat bijna hetzelfde is als een natuurgrasveld. En dat is natuurlijk een ideaal eindresultaat. Ja, en het is natuurlijk fantastisch om te zien dat door de resultaten die we hebben behaald binnen dit project, er inmiddels een sportveld is gerealiseerd in Londen op een dak. Maar zelfs helemaal in Japan een trainingsveld met dezezelfde technologie. En dat is waar we het voor doen. I want to go back to the slice that I showed you previously, this one. Because it's actually what you saw in the movie is about bringing together the interests of not only us as a pu uh, public sector, but bringing together the knowledge institutes. They need to have time to do the research, develop this new knowledge, but also from the private partner, help them to create a new business model. So we really had to wait to keep a even uh, to Kiva to have it really measured in their span of time too. So it's really interesting, how do you bring all this interest together and then develop that for yourself into this new idea? So, so we go right now through sports, but one back. So what did we learn? Because we do several of these projects uh, annually. So it's about stepping forward, take the initiative, inspire, but also facilitate. It's not only about demanding, but it's having really this conversation. Be aware that we need a new type of safe space dialogue, what we call it. So really thinking about how do we communicate? What's our role and responsibility? And what are you facing? Especially when you are a private partner, sometimes you're you, you can't step in because your insurance company is not working together with you or it is something else. How can we help each other coming further? Then learn and scale up at once because we don't have that much time. So it's also about speeding up. So what we say, ask, start asking. Encourage your customer to, your, your local customer to ask for new things. And don't be afraid of the risk because we can share risks too. Become a big buyer of innovation and be aware what you can do. And then you have a beautiful saying in Japan, what I, Japanese, I, I can't pronounce it, but it's something saying like, if you ask a right, the duck comes with the green onion on his back. And if you Google this, you have a lot of animation about it. And Japanese loves it because all the ingredients comes together at once. Yeah. And what do you get at once? That's, of course, not only the sustainable goals like the people, planet, profit, natural capital. 
but also you have an inspirational story. Yes, we can do this and we can do this within what we already have. And within what we are already doing, knowing, facing the future right now, today. So, let's get moving. We are here at this planet, as humans, for approximately 200,000 years. We are 2,000 years a Western society, and only 200 years we are the industrialized society. Take into account, it's such a small time. And we only have 20 years to solve our biggest problems. Because otherwise, <laughs> that charge is becoming reality. And we don't want it. We don't have to. I think we have all the opportunities already here. We have to start listening to each other, discussing all kinds of new innovation. But above all, innovate our socks off within the regular assignment, within what we're doing already today. And then, uh, well, I hope you have a very inspirational day today. Thank you. So, thank you so much for your uh, contribution today. And thank you for coming to, to our office. Just, um, just, just to kick it off, because uh, this is totally inspiring, right? So you, I, I saw some really new images that I have never seen before, <laughs> actually uh, creating the urgency of, um, of, of, of the innovation that we're about to, well, we need to undertake in the next in the next 20 years, and you gave a solution as well, like CR Cities as, as major launching customers for digital innovations. And as ever, we are part of the C40 yep. initiative, uh, very much involved with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and as today, the, the, the subject is on digital innovation. How do you see the digital um, transformation actually being a part of this, of this global um, initiative to, to, to climate change resolution, well, if you like? It, it doesn't matter that much with type of innovation it is. You have to start learning with innovation today. Because we have to be aware that we were very focused on price for the past decades. So we have very lean and mean organizations. And sometimes just exported all the knowledge. Well, we have to bring this back. And we have to think, what do we need for the future? And how can I be part of this process of making the future today. What is my role as giving the assignor, assignment? And it's not, it, it can be a physical uh, innovation, it can be a digital innovation, but it's not only about asking, but it's learning my whole op uh, operation. How do I do this? And especially, how do I incorporate in a public assignment something that I'm not so familiar with? Sometimes it's a bit risky. And if I'm only focused on, on having the lowest price, do I have the best project? Do I have the best organization? Or do we have to learn each other from the scratch? Because it's not what we're going to do new, but doing it today with what we already have. I think we, 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 must, we most often forget that it's about now, acting right now and taking, okay, embrace the risks together. Embracing the risk and stretching the imagination. And That's stretching the <laughs> imagination, <laughs> of course. Okay. Inspirational capital is key. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. So maybe I, I open the floor for any questions from the floor. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, Paul, do you want to? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I can uh, give you the mic. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Paul Jans. I'm involved in a lot of, uh, let's say, innovation district developments mm -hmm. and uh, living labs, uh, real-time test environments yeah. are, uh, in most cases, very important. And what we've learned from that is that it's about managing that quadruple helix play. So you were talking about the triple helix. Uh, I know as Amsterdam you have developed a uh, policy on innovation districts. Mm -hmm. Can you say something about how to engage local communities to that? Um, well, in my program, we have an, uh, the community involved by the assignment itself. So if we uh, work in a neighborhood, because we work in the real assignment, of course, we have the interviews with the people who are actually living there. For sport pitches, it's a little bit different, but you have, of course, a very uh, broad uh, clubs uh, in uh, Amsterdam, and we interview them. 
So we incorporate them, but really on the spot. It's not that we're doing a broad research to the uh, municipality that other def uh, departments for, but because we really work on a spot, we interview the people who are living there around it and also take their interests, of course, in account. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Now I think that social, yeah. social innovation is really important uh, aspect of being successful. Uh, for instance, the 22 at Barcelona Innovation yeah. District, there we saw with the nine super blocks, it is really important to engage the local communities. So I think you're doing that already in Amsterdam, so that's why I was asking about it. Yeah, no, it's, it's really important. I always say the result is in the end the quality times the acceptance. And acceptance is from the community, but it's also acceptance in your organization that you take a bit of risk. And in a risk-avoiding organization, well, learning to deal with risk is the thing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Paul, for your question. Thanks, Sasha. Maybe an applause. <coughs> As we move to the next uh, speaker, I want to welcome to the stage Wouter Lomans. Wouter is a senior project developer at Local, um, a project developer which we embarked on a journey together um, probably a year ago, yes. um, where we uh, tried to develop together a, um, a high-rise building in Rotterdam, uh, and it's supposed to be a very sustainable high-rise building and um, uh, local from this project we we launched a term parametric investment a term that uh, Walter is going to present about today thanks Th Walter thank you very much Matthew um, good afternoon thank you very much for being here uh, welcome uh, everybody um, try to start this presentation uh, like Matthew say, uh, said I'm Wouter Lomans I'm working for uh, local we like to believe we are a very innovative uh, uh, real estate developer uh, from The Hague uh, working only in inner city uh, uh, real estate developments um, uh, currently in, uh, in the Randstad. Um, we've experienced in the past years uh, several projects, several high-rise projects in, in the city of The Hague and also in Rotterdam. And within these traditional projects uh, we did, uh, we tried to make high-rise buildings. And we experienced a lot of problems with these uh, projects because um, we try to do these projects in a traditional way, making new designs, uh, try to uh, convince a uh, government, uh, municipality, uh, that these are really good projects, and of course they could be, are feasible. Uh, but in many cases, the, the designs were rejected by municipality on very minor aspects, we, uh, we believe. Uh, for this uh, image, this is an image of our project uh, Boogie Boogie, or uh, in the past we called it uh, uh, be proud um, and for this project we actually made three preliminary designs and two final designs to convince the uh, local government uh, the municipality that, that this could be feasible in the end um, uh, the design you see right now um, was um, um, uh, was stopped because of several trees in the um, uh, in the streets which you see in the in the in the uh, lower part. Um, so in this way, we actually had a lot of learning costs. Uh, you could say almost three million of sunk costs uh, for designing before we actually could make the design we wanted to make. Right now, we have a, a, a permit for this design for the same location, which is called Boogie Boogie. Um, and this was actually uh, because of this traditional uh, way of designing. We uh, were motivated to. Uh, uh, to, to work in a new way and to invite uh, Arab in our design team to find new ways uh, to, to collaborate together with municipality and to, make, to find the best fit for our project uh, uh, market uh, combination. Um, this was actually uh, the moment that we thought we should collaborate together with a uh, uh, party like Arab. Uh, because if you could, if you watch through this scheme, and you uh, see this as a design uh, uh, design scheme. At the beginning, you don't invest a lot of money, but you have a lot of influence on the design itself. And due the process, uh, the investment on the design, or actually in the end, the, the building, the cost on this it will rise, but the influence on the design will decrease. And for this reason, you would actually have the best information at the beginning of your design. And this is where we believe parametric investment actually starts. Um, 
because in this, uh, in this uh, stage of the designing, you need all the information uh, to combine it and to find the best fit for a location. Afterwards, you, we believe you can start parametric designing itself, uh, making the best floor plans, making the most efficient uh, uh, facade schemes, uh, for instance, or constructions, construction screen, uh, screens. Um, in these large-scale projects, uh, we face a lot of parameters uh, we have to understand as a real estate developer. Sunspots, wind climate, surrounding noise, all kinds of aspects which are very influential on the actual size, uh, the mass, the position, and also the function inside the building. Um, this is our work, uh, we believe, as uh, real estate developers, because if we don't understand these parameters, we, don't, we can't make a good design, you can't make a good building, which will be uh, a good product to sell in the end. Um, so this is maybe also why we call, uh, our, uh, we call ourselves local. Uh, we need local knowledge uh, to make a good projects and to have a good understanding what we can do. Um, not only about the projects, but in this case also uh, very uh, particular, the urban physics. Uh, the context of uh, to connect the uh, product market combination uh, to these parameters is also very important. This is also if an aspect we uh, should do as a real estate developer, because in this way we know, have a good understanding what kind of products, is it an office, is it a house, is it the student housing, what kind of housing is it on this location, and what is the influence of the, uh, of the parameters in the surroundings. And we believe that also the uh, evaluation uh, with investors and also very important. Municipality is very important. And in this way, uh, using the, uh, the parametric investments, uh, we can have a better understanding of all these aspects and also have a very precise discussion with these investors and the municipality. Choosing the right parameters for uh, a, a modeling is very important. It's actually very key. And you can't do this at once. Uh, you, may, you might have uh, an understanding at the beginning or a gasp of a, uh, what it might be, uh, but starting uh, with this parametric uh, designing or investing uh, gives you better understanding what you actually can do in the end. Um, so in the, in the beginning uh, for this project, Hart Notin, you, you see the sketch uh, for this project in the city center of, uh, of Rotterdam, uh, on the top of a metro station, uh, in the, yeah, the downtown city center where more than 50,000 people a day uh, walk in and out, uh, we, had a good we needed a good understanding what the lo location is about. Um, second, we try to find the preferred urban vo volume, which has an influence on all the surrounding, uh, on, on the surroundings with sunspots, with winds, uh, with settlements on the location, on the metro station, for instance. We need to have, uh, we, we need to define what's the best product on this location, because with the best product, we have the best profit in the project, and we can actually uh, um, uh, ex um, ex execute this project. Um, starting this project, we, uh, uh, we found out we had to find about five to eight critical uh, uh, parameters. And we asked uh, also Arab to build uh, algorithms to these uh, parameters. And this is also why you need a very good uh, party like Arab, uh, which can make the algorithms which uh, can be checked um, and um, are vi uh, viable. Um, Afterwards, we, of course, with these parameters, we uh, started to uh, analyze the possible solutions on this location and started to evaluate together with the municipality what's the best fit uh, on this location. Well, for the project, uh, in this case, uh, Hart Notin, we had several uh, KPIs, uh, the size, the sunspots, uh, the daylight inside the building, for instance, but also the settlements uh, of the size, the big size building next to the metro station, which was very important to determine where, what's the best position also for the building and maybe also the best construction method of, this, uh, of, the, of the tower. It's a tower of about 185 meters high, so you can imagine that the settlements can be uh, quite big. Um, 
Arab helped us with their team uh, to uh, tra yeah, to make all these uh, parameters into uh, a parameter sp space, which allowed us to actually uh, uh, play with these parameters. And um, yeah, we, we met in the design uh, um, uh, stage, we met every two weeks. Every two weeks we got 3,500 new models to evaluate and to check and to find out what's the best fit in this case. What can we learn from these models? And how can we use this knowledge to find new uh, solutions and also validate which are the, the parameters actually the right ones and uh, should we change those uh, parameters? Uh, well, you see in this, um, and this was also for us, this helped us also to convince uh, uh, municipality and also other uh, stakeholders in the surroundings. Uh, to have an understanding what the impact of these parameters actually are um, on the size and position and uh, the shape of the building, uh, which gave us also to our architect, uh, Meccano in this case, um, what the best uh, shape for the building is and had made a very good starting point uh, to make an actual design. Uh, right now we're in a stage where we uh, 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 chose a volume uh, and uh, Meccano uh, made an architectural design in the sketch design. Um, we believe that with the parameter uh, of a parametric uh, investment uh, experience, we, ha we found new solutions and better understanding of the location. Uh, we have a better insight of the impacts and the complexity of the, of, of, of the building on the site itself. Uh, by using this model, we got more commitment from stakeholders, uh, not only the municip municipality, but also the stakeholders in the surrounding, by showing the model and show them what the impact actually is. Um, but another aspect which is also very important, we discovered, because since it, this is new for us, that there is also a shift in responsibilities. You get more information for up front, uh, which brings in that you also have to uh, 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 have different discussions with, for instance, municipality, on settlements, uh, for instance, and I'm not sure if I should go go a little bit deeper into this, but um, as soon as you ask in an in an early stage uh, to the municipality what the possible uh, settlements on the locations are, uh, they they're quite uh, defensive, uh, where you actually hope that they're quite open to have the discussion to find new solutions, and it is. This is a shift where I believe uh, we have to yeah, learn and understand from each other to how to work with these kind of uh, uh, modelings to find the best fit on this location. Uh, most of all, uh, and this is also very important of course for us as a real estate developer, uh, we believe that we uh, had a very efficient design cost. Uh, we did less uh, modelling by a traditional architect with trial and error uh, we made a new model uh, in, in a way that we could find the best fit uh, together with Arab and afterwards start uh, d starting designing. So for us, this is a starting point for new projects and I hope we'll have new opportunities uh, in the future to uh, uh, yeah, uh, put it in new, <laughs> new uh, opportunity, uh, opportunities in other cities as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. So thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Walter, for that. Uh Clear, very clear presentation on how actually um, at the moment we're using um, data-driven design solutions for yes. our current our current projects. So, so what are what are the what are the challenges that have that hadn't been addressed by this new way of addressing design processes? Could you elaborate uh, a bit more on that? As, uh, can, can you explain a little bit more? So, what are, what are the challenges that that um, that you still face moving forward with this? Yeah, but still face uh, is, is the weight, the settlements. This is still a, a very difficult uh, discussion. Uh, we have to validate and also the wind uh, is still a an, 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 an difficult discussion uh, with the municipality. I believe we have to evolve these kind of models even more to have a, a, yeah, to bring it to the next level to also convince municipality what the impact of these uh, of a tower is in the future. Mm. Uh, I, I believe we can uh, evolve this uh, even further, yes.
Yeah, so what, could you say that, that you know, if you, if you choose a data-driven design process, that also other stakeholders need to be, start to be accustomed to uh, getting yes. in more data at different times than yeah. they might be expecting? Yeah, and that's a difficulty. And that's still the challenge, that's, right? That's and probably that maybe, the biggest cha challenge, yeah. And then bringing back to the first presentation, that, that the more risk, in, um, in, in a Rotterdam, risk not, approach, yeah. you can, then can start to innovate. That's true. In, in, in Rotterdam, that not that uh, far uh, as Amsterdam is, I think, uh, at, this, at this moment. So, so they're very uh, enthusiastic about this uh, way of, of working. Um, so, well, uh, I hope we have, uh, have a collaboration to, together with the municipality over there as well uh, to, to improve develop this. the thinking. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank well, you. thanks. Any, any other questions from the, from the, from the Zaal, the room? Joop? Yo, Paul from Arab. Like, I, I was wondering, like, using this new model, like, how does the relationship changes between the stakeholders? And, and the most interested on how it changes trust. Can, can, you, can you say something about that? Yeah. Um, for, for us, at the beginning, it was a little bit difficult because we can't directly influence the model. So we have to understand what you as a designer are doing and have to understand what the input of the design of the of these algorithms are um, so we needed time for this uh, and after doing this first project i believe in the future that it will be easier but for municipality um, it's a different case uh, we have to convince them that the algorithms are directly transformed into the uh, uh, from their uh, leg legislation we use their legislation uh, uh, to make your uh, algorithm our algorithm. Uh, the funny thing is that, in a way, uh, by investing in this model, uh, we try, yeah, we help the municipality to transform their legislation into algorithms. Um, so actually, I hope in the future the cities were actually the owners of these algorithms, and we can use these algorithms so we don't have to invest in this alone. Because in a way, the cities uh, actually have more benefits than we, uh, uh, in the end, from these algorithms. So, and this is also a shift, I believe, uh, uh, which is very important to have an understanding how it works and, and wha what we actually invest in uh, to make better cities in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Yes. And I'll see you back for the panel discussion later. Um, but, but first, I would like to uh, announce our final presenter today, uh, Michaela Turin, Associate Professor at the TU in Delft. And she's going to look a bit, bit into the future. Okay, what, what is she working on that will facilitate uh, digital disruption in the near future when thinking about um, these digital services that we're talking about today? Thanks, Michaela. Thank you very much, Matthew, for, uh, for the introduction. Huh? I'm now shifting... Uh, to the presentation, uh, um, yes, um, I work at the Department of Architecture, Engineering uh, um, and uh, Technology, where I lead uh, the section of digital technologies. We are a pretty large team, uh, uh, indeed embracing uh, a very diverse uh, set of uh, um, challenges uh, within uh, the new digital horizons, uh, uh, very much related to what the first uh, presentation was mentioning. Uh, today, I only take uh, a, a smaller uh, perspective within this larger uh, and broader set. Focusing on climate resilience, uh, I want to bring forward the message that integration uh, is quite imperative. Um, we really need integration at different levels in order to be able to cope and to uh, tackle the complexity that is inherent to uh, climate resilience. And integration uh, means uh, integration across stakeholders. Uh, where I think it's very important to challenge uh, the traditional separation uh, that usually we would face uh, across data, information, uh, but also really the decision making uh, um, that happens uh, uh, across stakeholders. And we need to do that from the very early stage uh, of the decision making process. Integration is integration across scales. Um, I'm a very big fan of uh, uh, questioning uh, the stepped approach uh, from where we go from the large massing uh, down step by step into a detailed phase. I think it's really needed to be able to have a multi scalar approach from the early stage where uh, we think of what the impact of certain components, certain materials, uh, certain building technology uh, features have uh, on the larger scale and vice versa, thinking throughout all of them together. 
and integration across experts, uh, experts in the architecture engineering sector, uh, where uh, I think we really need to enhance the collaboration uh, in the very early stage uh, of the design process, uh, helping them to assess and consider and different design alternatives from different perspectives, different disciplinary knowledge domains. So I'm very much interested in what Digital Horizon can actually do for these, and I'm looking at them as a uh, a way and, and, uh, and a roadmap to enhance and empower uh, the design team, uh, bringing a different perspective together uh, in uh, uh, the built environment in order to uh, make decisions based on a better understanding and higher knowledge. Um, there are different approaches to do that. I believe there is not like one unique approach. I'm going to present one of the possibilities uh, for a matter of time, uh, but, but please, it's just like one angle uh, of the option that we can, uh, that we can embrace. Um, I'm referring back to um, uh, also the presentation before, where we have uh, the option of uh, comparing uh, uh, different design alternatives in a parametric way. We have the ability to generate uh, uh, form and shape a uh, variety of materials and options in a parametric way and assess them upon uh, a large variety of key performance indicators. Uh, we can automate that uh, in a uh, rather advanced way nowadays, and we can drive it uh, even uh, um, by optimization procedures, uh, uh, machine learning uh, uh, processes. Uh, uh, but I think that nowadays, we the new perspective uh, that computational intelligence uh, offers uh, to our domain, uh, we can empower that even further. Um, and I want to tackle, uh, uh, let's say, step by step uh, um, those three aspects uh, with some brief examples. Uh, they will not be exhaustive, uh, they will be very shallow, but uh, I want to just give a glimpse uh, of what I mean uh, uh, across them one by one, starting from uh, what can we do uh, for example, in the assessment part. We usually use computational simulations uh, as one of the uh, possible way of uh, assessing how good or uh, bad uh, a certain design solution performs uh, for a certain number of uh, performance indicators. Um, I think it's still a very important uh, approach and there's still a lot to be done there. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's still also very often a bottleneck in the process. Uh, uh, computational simulations can be extremely heavy, can be very demanding, computationally speaking, time-wise. Uh, um, and, and nowadays, the opportunities open by machine learning can support and facilitate that integration, uh, which especially in the very early phase of design, uh, where we really need to be agile and take decisions that are fast uh, shifting from different alternatives is extremely important. So surrogate models are one of the options we, uh, um, we are looking into. I'm taking this example uh, um, from uh, um, uh, the energy refurbishment uh, um, uh, spectrum. Uh, um, so it involves ex also existing buildings uh, uh, as uh, uh, one of the possible uh, examples where uh, the amount of data that is needed in order to uh, assess uh, current performances uh, of uh, certain topologies of buildings uh, are pretty high. Some of them come from real data, but we definitely can integrate them uh, uh, with synthetic data from simulation. But if we do that step by step, uh, again, it can be extremely time consuming in the communication across stakeholders and with customers. What we have done in this project uh, uh, was uh, basically creating uh, quite a large number of uh, uh, simulated uh, cases for uh, uh, a specific typology, which then is representative of a broader set of cases. So there is some level of generalization that is possible. We use those, this data set to train machine learning models to enlarge the data set and generate surrogate models that therefore provide a backend uh, of, uh, in this case, a tool uh, that is provided with a front end uh, that is online, uh, that giving a dashboard uh, uh, to decision makers uh, that can, on the one end, uh, roughly, and it's really a rough estimation, eh? so it's, uh, it's an estimate uh, with approximation. It's a machine learning model and it's in the general sense of a typology but can give a rough estimation of the expected energy consumption uh, and then uh, implement in certain uh, um, refurbishment interventions. Uh, in this case, we only had one demonstrator. What if we had different trump walls uh, as one of the possible renovation measures could be done in principle with others, uh, different thicknesses of insulation, uh, and so on. 
And we have seen that this indeed like an incident discussion is just a, a very agile way to bring people together and to start discussing about possible solution, intuitive enough to be somehow understood also by the inhabitants, uh, the residents of the different uh, units. Now, that still works uh, in a rather predefined way. We decide the parameters, right? So we, we decide what different type of uh, variations uh, there are, thicknesses, rather the number of elements that, that are inputted. But what if, instead of having to predetermine that, uh, we give the freedom uh, to the computational process to enlarge those parameters even more? So we go then into generative uh, um, processes uh, where uh, uh, we don't only predecide uh, in advance uh, the variations uh, that no matter uh, how, uh, let's say, numerous they are, uh, usually they would still be limited in the sense that they play within uh, the ranges of the predefined parameters uh, within their boundaries. Uh, um, now, this is an example, it's, it's from a student, uh, uh, so it's, it's an abstract uh, example for a grid shell, but the interesting part is that uh, starting from a number of samples, uh, we can actually apply variational autoencoders in this way uh, that are able to generate solutions uh, that uh, exceed the boundaries, so that are basically not um, part of the initial uh, solution space of a parametric model. And in this way, basically, um, the, the process can be the same. We still can have surrogate models that are rather fast. We still can have uh, optimization to achieve a certain uh, performance, optimize a certain performance. In this case, a given uh, uh, reaction to a, a load, a simplified example. But we definitely can uh, um, exceed uh, the pre-decided uh, uh, design option that the designer could think of. And the last part, I think, is uh, where at the moment we um, are really interested in bringing together uh, uh, expertise in not only being able to identify a good design solution, but rather to explore that, uh, um, that, that, that set of variations, um, which sometimes are pretty um, numerous. There are really many alternatives. Having uh, a lot of uh, information and data sometimes is risky in the sense that it's like not having, not having it, right? It's, it's too much to really make sense out of it. And there are computational techniques uh, that can help us better understanding uh, the data and, and what we are looking at. Um, I, I'm showing some examples from complex projects. I refer back to the example of, of, of Sasha, where uh, sport buildings and sport facilities are pretty demanding in terms of uh, a number of uh, indicators, including energy. Um, and the number of parameters as well as the performances are uh, quite broad. So what you see here, for example, is a machine learning uh, process that uses clustering uh, that helps uh, somehow um, not only understanding and mapping and finding correlations uh, between input parameters and output values for performances, for quite a different range of performances, giving the landscape of the performances, uh, but also somehow trying to help the designer navigate through it uh, with the logic of uh, the geometry. We are very much used usually to have the performances as a result of the model uh, and to drive uh, uh, all the choices based on that. Uh, but it's important in the dialogue between engineers and architects to take into account that geometry and the quality of space and what that means uh, for the architect to actually be able to visually assess, uh, to, to get a direct feeling of uh, uh, the two-dimensionality that comes out of it is very important. So clustering, being able to cluster upon geometric features, uh, the model, and navigate this, the performance space, the performance landscape, uh, based on that, uh, is proven to be quite uh, uh, helpful. And we're trying to investigate future, uh, further, uh, let's say, way to do that, even in a more, uh, let's say, playful way, engaging, therefore, uh, different stakeholders. Uh, um, in this case, kind of a game engine uh, uh, situation uh, where uh, the landscape that you see there uh, is uh, um, derived from self-organizing maps, uh, which are a specific type uh, of uh, uh, organizing maps uh, based uh, on machine learning. So it's an advanced way of clustering, basically, where uh, we merge surrogate models uh, with, uh, together with clustering. Uh, and um, architects somehow are provided with this game engine uh, where they can navigate uh, through uh, each, each cell represents a certain number of performances that are graphically represented. One can 
move into the cell, explore with an avatar uh, um, the different designs that are associated to that, uh, and, and, and literally get, at the same time, a numeric quantification versus a um, more intuitive visual exploration of what the resulting space is. And again, this is really all about bringing engineers and architects together in this dialogue and facilitating the stakeholders to, to really get an intuitive understanding of what the implications are. Very briefly, but I hope I gave a glimpse uh, of, what, uh, uh, of what I mean with this, uh, with this loop. Uh, and I stress one, once more that this is just one of the possible attempts uh, to, to, to really try to enhance integration, uh, which going back to the initial message uh, is uh, uh, kind of an ultimate goal uh, that, uh, that to me and to us uh, are uh, um, quite important. And I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michaela. Thanks for this uh, elaboration on uh, where, it's, where, where what, what the work you're doing and where then uh, the industry is going. And it's nice that you also put an emphasis on collaboration, probably some, something we should discuss at the, at the panel discussion uh, later. So how do you see the collaboration between universities like, like yours and, and, and companies like, like Arab in the now uh, and in the future? How do you see this collaboration yeah, moving it's, forward? It's absolutely crucial. Several of the projects that I was actually quickly going through our action in collaboration with, uh, with Arup. Um, and I do believe that it's really uh, important to have this constant uh, uh, interface between uh, a knowledge institution like a university and uh, uh, practice. Um, I see the role of a uh, uh, university kind of uh, trying to be Experimental. We are, we are re literally like uh, trying out certain direction and exploring uh, uh, front-end uh, uh, um, solutions that, that we really need to test whether they work or not. Something that not always in practice perhaps is, is possible to do it in applied projects, but we absolutely cannot do that disconnected from uh, real needs uh, and, and, and really daily practice. And I think that vice versa, we really need to learn from each other. Uh, being grounded from our side into... Um, um, actual needs, uh, and, and uh, our ultimate goal, nevertheless, is to facilitate what happens in practice, right? Uh, it definitely shouldn't stay within the, yeah, the room of, uh, of a university only. It's really going to be applied. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and at the same time, I think, you know, we, we, we get a lot of inspiration from, from what's happening at Delft. And in the collaboration, we can also, you know, take a more educated risk of where, where it's going and, and try to move things forward. So, uh, so it's, uh, I think it's a good double helix that's, yeah, that's, uh, wonderful. that's happening here, <laughs> at least. So, um, so are there any questions from the, from the room that we should address? Or shall we move straight to the panel discussion? I see one... Move forward to the panel discussion. Okay, thanks, Paul. Okay, can I invite back to the stage Sasha and, uh, and Wouter? And um, we wanted to take a bit more lively, so we didn't uh, sit you down on seats. So uh, um, recognizing the time of day. So um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to 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 start off this this discussion with 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 the helix discussion. I heard triple helix. Then Paul mentioned something about. Uh, about uh, quadruple helix, and and could you know if we move forward with this you know artificial intelligence and and digital solutions, should we actually be thinking about a, f a f potential helix or five-way helix? And the, the the digital solutions are actually part of of the um, the overall solution, particularly when it's um, facilitating uh, collaboration um, uh, and and communication. Would that be a suggestion we could take from this meeting? Uh, maybe open the floor. Maybe start with you, Sasha. Uh, well, yeah, what do you think about it? The helix, the double helix, the double, triple helix also. But I think this is the nice part of the digital world and machine learning. What we used to incorporate and then it's... Uh, we, we have to go to radical inclusion, so it's incorporate everything, and that's what machine learning can help us with. And that's also, it's not only about what do I need right now, but it's incorporating the future. What's happening with the wind in 10 years? Do we have already insight into that model? And what are we learning right now? So I think that one of the biggest things that we can achieve from the digital revolution is that we are radical inclusive for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Um, Bauta, do you want yeah, well, to I, elaborate I, on that? Yeah, I, I hope we will head to a situation like that. Th I think that will be very good, uh, especially since our uh, assignments are so, uh, yeah, so, so difficult, uh, have so many different aspects. 
uh, and we have a more open platform to have an underst a mutual understanding about the situation. I think it's necessary. Otherwise, we uh, can't evaluate to a new, new uh, and better uh, uh, surrounding. We, we divide build everything. Environment. I'm sorry. Yeah, but we have a common interest, and in that's keeping a very well lovable city, creating lovable cities. That's our common interest yes. yeah. as humans, as who we are all. But we divided everything, and I think digital education can help us to integrate everything again. Can he it, yeah. It, 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 okay. Sorry. Please. No, no. If I can add, uh, and I really like the idea, me too, of uh, of having this kind of of looking at this as one additional partner uh, in uh, the entire picture, uh, with one warning, uh, however, um, I think that we still need. A uh, nowadays, it's really important, in my view, to keep a very critical eye on uh, on what actually it means. Uh, uh, the black box approach uh, is probably something which we are uh, uh, we still need to avoid. Uh, um, we. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking really in terms of uh, crit critical look on what data we are using, but also what models we are building uh, uh, is, is really far from being something that is automating uh, entirely a process. Uh, I think it's really a partner that needs to be in the entire discourse, but with all the other partners still keeping a close eye on what's, uh, on what's yeah. happening. So, so what you're saying is uh, we should see these digital solutions as, as uh, augmenting the process and, and, uh, and stimulating collaboration instead of taking over the whole process and it, and you get into a situation where the computer says something and, and we it's have just to believe believed. it. Exactly. exactly. That's a, that's a, it's a, it's that's a, a big risk. A, yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, I believe we, in the end, there are some key members in, in the whole situation mm. who make decisions. And that's something different than have an understanding about the situation. Yes. Uh, so if, if you explain this up front, then everybody understands why you need an understanding to make the right decision. And you can explain it in the right way. But in the end, we want to make a decision mm -hmm. of what's the best product market combination, for instance, mm -hmm. because of a certain uh, uh, situation. So you mean, uh, you know, uh, so digital, digital tools like, like Arab Inform that you presented in your, in your, uh, in your piece, um, they should enable decision making. They yes. shouldn't take over the decision making because uh, that's not that's not what it's supposed to be doing no. anyway. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Yep. Sasha, do you uh, want to add something to that? Yeah. Uh, well, there's something that's a bit bothering me actually. Are we optimizing things that we're already doing, or are we contributing to the transition that's going on? I was I had the honor to be in Davo this year, and they don't talk about stranded assets anymore. They talk about mass extinction. That's a really different thing, because we like to talk about successes. But the thing is, we're facing such an urgent threat that it's not only about, are we all comfortable <laughs> with this decision? Are we all doing well in the, the role that we know? But are we really taking steps forward to make fiercely attractive places to live for our children and grandchildren? Yeah. And that's really what is at stake. And, and, and I think, we didn't mention that enough. And then it looks like it's all funny, nice things, and well, shouldn't you be on my chair or so? Mm -hmm. well, I am not so afraid of models that are making better decisions than we are doing as humans, because we have proven as humans that we are not taking the right decisions. That's true. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> so what, what you're saying, Sasha, is it not, you know, the, the time is so precious that we still have. Uh, cheese grating is not enough. No. We should look for paradigm shifts. Yeah, we, we should be and a little bit more brave and bold. Yeah. Yes. So, Mi Michaela, how, how do you think then these uh, digital solutions could support these paradigm mm. shifts that Sasha is looking for? Is it? I, I, th I think they're really forcing us indeed. Uh, I completely agree with what you're saying. Uh, and, and I think they are forcing us on, uh, uh, on, on a paradigm shift uh, uh, indeed, uh, making us, first of all, rethinking our role. Uh, I think that one of the, which was not addressed in the presentation by me, but uh, um, one of the, the, the big opportunities uh, is really also being able to extract in a much faster way, indeed, mm -hmm. uh, an understanding of, yeah. uh, of certain, so availability of data, and again, a question uh, to which extent they are, uh, we need to validate them, we need to, to have the right data and the meaningful data. But when they are available, uh, then indeed uh, the amount of insights that can be extracted from there uh, uh, is, is really empowered uh, in, in terms of also speed. Um, and, and 
I think we really need to rethink uh, our role uh, on, in that process, right? It's a new way of thinking, a new way of working. Uh, we absolutely shouldn't adopt, I think, shouldn't keep the current model uh, just uh, uh, with the addition yeah. of some uh, um, even the adjustments. It's, it, it does really yeah. require a different way of thinking. Yeah. So I, I really think that, that the having a, dis a digital discussion can't be without talking about trust, about safe space dialogue, about what do we need from each other to make the right decision. So yes. you're making a fiercely attractive building and we are having a fiercely attractive society. I think that's so important. So you, you can't skip both. It, 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 it is actually, it's not about a triple helix, it's about having a city, having a place, a physical place. We are living somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and we have our assets and the things that we value here. Then we have data and then we have... And, and something that solutions. I think it yeah. helps in the process is uh, the fact that um, the computational uh, workflow nevertheless forces us to make explicit uh, yeah. certain, uh, uh, so to verbalize, to formalize, uh, yeah. to really kind of discuss and debate uh, even what the parameters mm. should yeah. be, right? Or yeah. what uh, the data we need. So it, it kind of really forces everyone to form a common language uh, that kind of becomes transversal yeah. across, uh, across yeah, domains. Common, uh, common narrative, I yeah. completely agree. But it, it's all about trust. So actually it's a triple helix between trust, a place, a data, what can we do next? So what, what do we need together? Yeah. So, is, so could you could you say then that that these um, you know digital platforms that we are creating can establish a common a common language in which it facilitates trust, yeah. so that that the, the the targets that we're setting ourselves are you know realistic enough and ambitious enough to um, to enable more climate resiliency and more livable cities. Well, I hope so because the other. The other side of the currency is that we get really afraid and that you will have the haves who are on the right spots of the world and the not haves who are, well, some th somewhere floating or so. Somewhere else. So, so, so we have to say this is all about also about uh, poor people, rich people, the privileged, the not privileged. It is about the way we are acting in society right now. If you have people who are anxi have anxieties about uh, and, and insecurities about how we are governed, it's also incorporated within what we are doing right now. Yeah. So there are two sides of the same model. Yes, it can help us, but it can also, well, bring us despair. Mm -hmm. So we have to take very much in account that we have to create this secure, safe spaces and be frank and open with what we are doing. Yes. I think right. so. But that, that does, does of course, ask also a very different way of acting yes. as investors, as real estate developers, designers, but also as a municipality and a government. And this is what we have to learn, I believe. And oh. This will take a while bef because their trust is a really important part. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I believe if we start working on this, we uh, we can have a, a bigger leap at once. Um, that, but that also, I want to reflect on, on a thing. Uh, in the discussion right now, there are, of course, I'm working on a smaller scale, and I'm working with yeah, stakeholders, which I know and I can easily uh, 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 connect to. Yeah. Uh, in the discussion you just had, uh, you're, you're almost debating on humanity skill which is a different level, of course, and both have to be good. And the funny thing is that with this data-driven uh, working, uh, you can connect, connect the two things together mm -hmm. and show what the impact is. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that, that's funny, of course. It's different than just showing a design yeah. and, and reflect on what that, the impact actually is. Yeah, and, and, and again, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I agree. Um, and something which I think is important to, to bring forward is that even when we really like uh, enlarge the scale and we go beyond uh, local boundaries, uh, but still nevertheless, uh, um, one of the crucial aspects is, for example, minorities that are underrepresented, right? We, we really get, once more, uh, any computational process will always compute uh, 
what the inputs are. And I think we have been really very good so far in generating inputs or data in this case uh, um, that really re represent certain groups, uh, certain uh, uh, majorities, certain, and, and others are completely underrepresented. So I think, again, the biases that are in, uh, uh, even in a simple data set are still very, very high. And, and that's also why I keep encouraging uh, a critical eye on, uh, on uh, uh, what is not in that data set is just being left out at that point from the entire mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's also the weak spot, I believe. So you have to be very keen on, on the algorithms that you can really trust them because if they're miss, <laughs> the, whole, yeah. the whole model is, yeah. is it's wrong. It's easier, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. easy to make big but mistakes. Yeah, so, yeah. It, so that the data is big, crucial. Yeah. Okay, that's a very interesting uh, conclusion. I was just wondering, uh, Rinka, are there any questions from the chat? No, they're pretty shy today. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty shy on the, on the chat, okay. So uh, is there anything you would like to, uh, to elaborate on or shall we uh, make the, conclude this, um, this panel discussion? Yeah, well, I, I, but I'm, I'm very inspired by your story uh, and, and the way you're very progressive actually by working with data-driven models uh, for uh, new improvements in the city. And I hope we also will do this in a, in a broader sense in other cities in the whole country. Uh, and also the ownership of these models. Uh, th this is also another aspect which I think we're just at the starting point of this, mm -hmm. uh, where we have to evolve new models also for the future, yeah. where we can collaborate on this. And I'm very curious what will happen in the coming years yeah. on this part. Yeah. Well, yes, and I believe that Arab can pay, take a big part in that. They are a private uh, engineering, as I said, in, in the Netherlands or in Amsterdam, I'm quite spoiled. We have our own department of engineering, so it makes sense that they have the same interests as the asset manager because we're one organization. While you, as Arab, you're working all over the world with cities, but you also have a public-private partnership. And sometimes that stands in the way of giving somebody the best future-proof advice. You'll have to take for yourself in account what is my role in this transition, and I'm encouraging you to do this very much, because otherwise <laughs> we can take these big steps and scale up all these kind of innovations very easily. It requires a different approach, and you are more or less also our knowledge institute. You are also our, uh, um, well, how do you say, it? our leverage. How do we connect this new type of dots? And what is your private role in this public debate? Yeah, so what, what you're urging is actually we should um, have more purpose as a, as, an, as a company to move into a more climate resilient future. Is it's not having you the purpose, but are you part of the purpose? Part of the purpose, yes, yes. exactly. And that's exactly actually our, our global <laughs> strategy um, has become. Okay. So uh, where we say sustainability is everything. Um, so from now on, we will try to pick up this uh, glove and, uh, and act with a certain purpose to move into the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, <laughs> Sasha, for that plea. And uh, thank you all for coming and listening to us. Um, thank you very much to our speakers, uh, Kajo Masterson, um, Sasha Stolp, Wouter Lomans, and uh, Michele Turin for coming and uh, having this lively debate with us here today. And um, that's it. And thanks all for watching. <laughs>